Well, hello everyone and welcome to chapter four. I'm really excited about talking about sensation and perception with you in this lecture. You'll find that this lecture has so many really fascinating details and many of these details almost promote and prompt other questions about your sensory and perceptual experiences. And as I was reading this chapter, there were a lot of questions I had and, and a lot of fascination and I found myself being in awe of how we're able to take in sensory information from the outside world and then physiologically and psychologically our brain and experiences and learning and culture help us make sense of and perceive that outside world. So you'll see this really cool connection between sensation and perception. Absolutely, we rely on our sensory systems to provide important information about our surroundings. We use this information to successfully navigate and interact with our environment so that we can eat and connect with other people and find shelter, maintain social relationships, and avoid getting harmed. So this chapter is going to be an overview of how we take sensory information, how that's received and processed by the nervous system. Also, how that processing of sensory information, how it affects our conscious experience of the world and ourselves inside of the world. We're going to talk about sensation and perception and then the physical senses and the sensory receptors and sensory processes of the major senses you have, especially vision and hearing. Throughout the chapter, you'll also see that I'm going to give you examples of sensory processes and perceptual processes that are pretty cool and pretty fascinating. And all in all, I want you to remember that this chapter finishes our first unit. In the first unit of this class, we've walked through some foundations of psychology, some foundations of research within psychology, as well as the smallest or most micro approaches to human behavior and mental processes. In chapter three, we were in the biological approach and essentially we're broadening out a little bit, but still looking at ourselves in a very small scale. Small or large, I want you to be excited about human behavior and mental processes. So don't forget that even though you're learning a lot of details about things, that we still wanna stay fascinated with the question, why do people do what they do? This chapter gives us another little insight and another little part of the puzzle to answer that question. Okay, so in this chapter, every time we're about to talk about a sense, we have to talk about two different facets of that sense. We have to talk about the physical properties of what that sense entails. So whether it's light or sound or touch, we need to talk about the physical properties of the stimuli that are coming in to our body from the outside or external world. And when that outside stimuli from the external world, when it hits our body and comes to our person, we then need to talk about the physical function of the specialized sense receptors that are able to take in that physical information from the outside world. That's essentially sensation. It's the process of receiving stimulus energies from the external environment. But sensation is just one part of the process. That's just receiving the message. That's just like your mailbox receiving mail. Just because there's mail inside of your mailbox doesn't mean that the message has been received by you, the person that is the home dweller, right? The one that opens the mail. It doesn't mean that just because the senses have taken in the physical energy that you as a person have perceived it. So the second part of this process is perception. And perception has to do with essentially the psychological part of organizing and interpreting sensory information from the sense receptors. It's your brain converting these experiences and these signals from the sense receptors into your psychological and perceptual experience. So in perception, that's where you take the letter into the house and open it up and read about what you've received. What's cool about that is once you've taken in information and perceived it, your brain also wants to work towards understanding the message, responding to the message, and understanding how to navigate the world from there. 
So if I understand that there's a threatening experience or something's unsafe around me, what's cool about my brain being able to perceive that danger is Bryn's going to get out of here. Bryn's going to go to a safer spot. She's going to realize, hey, I'm not just going to stay here and perceive danger. I'm also going to behave in such a way as to get to a safer place, a safer ground. So let's review that. What does it mean to sense something? Sensory receptors are specialized neurons that respond to specific types of physical energy from the natural world. That's physical energy and stimuli that are external. They're from the external environment. When sensory information is detected by a sensory receptor, sensation has occurred. So for example, light that enters the eye causes chemical changes in the cells that are at the back of the eye, in the retina of the eye. Those specialized cells, which in this case are rods and cones and the connecting cells to those rods and cones, in the form of action potentials, they convey that information to the central nervous system. So that conversion of sensory stimulus energy into an action potential, which we know is an electrochemical conversion, an electrochemical signal, that process of stimuli to action potential, that's called transduction. And that transduction process essentially takes the outside world, converts it into a form that can be sent to the central nervous system, spinal cord and brain. And that allows our brain to take in outside information and basically organize it and interpret it for the purpose of responding to it. So while our sensory receptors are constantly collecting information from the natural environment, stimuli from the external world, it's ultimately how the central nervous system integrates and understands and organizes and interprets that information that affect how we interact with the world. So perception, therefore, is the process that happens in the central nervous system and brain and it's the way that we take sensory information and organize it and interpret it and consciously experience it. So sensation is the process of receiving stimulus energy from the external environment and transforming that stimulus energy into neural impulses. That's transduction. And then perception is the process of organizing and interpreting and understanding and ultimately deciding how to respond at some point to that sensory information. That's the brain's comprehension of the external world. And it's your conscious experience of the world. So your perception is what's happening to you right now as you experience and interpret and listen to my voice. Bottom-up processing refers to the fact that perceptions are built from specific sensory input. Top-down processing has to do with how we interpret those sensations and how we're influenced by available knowledge, context, experience, and conscious thoughts. Okay, so let's understand that a little bit more specifically. Bottom-up processing is what happens when the external world the natural world around you, the stimuli in the natural world, they touch your sensory receptors. This is the mail being delivered and it's going inside of the mailbox. The sensory input from the outside world is being received by the right receptacle, the right receptor. So you're gonna go from the small thing, the stimulus energy in the world, to the sensory receptors taking it in, small little pieces, it's going to be transduced into a way that your brain can understand it and your brain will take it from the small pieces into a bigger and more comprehensive understanding of the world around you. In this metaphor, the outside world of stimulation is what we're considering the bottom, while the inside world of the mind and consciousness and understanding and expectations and psychological experience, that's the top. So in bottom-up processing, we're essentially talking about sensation. Sensation is generally considered a bottom-up process where you're taking external stimuli from the outside world. It's being received by specialized sense receptors 
and then it's being processed and sent to higher order structures in the brain in which perception can take place, where the mind can understand the experience, bottom up. Top down processing essentially goes in the opposite way. That's where my mind and my thinking and my expectations and my learning and my culture and the things that I understand lead me in my internal world, my brain, my processing, my memory. That's the influence of that internal world on my perceived experience. So when I say expectations and prior understanding, this is how what you've done before leads you to perceive things in certain ways. So in this sense, our available knowledge, our culture, our experiences, our current thoughts, those things, those top things are influencing the downward understanding of the sensations that we're receiving. One way to think of this is that sensation is a physical process, a bottom-up process, whereas perception is a more psychological process, and oftentimes perception can be thought of as top-down. So bottom-up processing would be walking into a house and sensing and smelling certain flowers. The nasal passages that you have are taking in these chemical airborne substances and your brain is connecting essentially with the stimulus energy in the outside world taking it in and your brain goes okay that chemical is a flower you've taken in the physical energy from the outside world the smell of the flower and been able to say to your brain hey this is a flower it's located in this space that i just walked into that would be bottom up sensory process from the outside world into perceptual understanding. Now, when you walk in that house and you smell the flower and immediately think to yourself, oh, that reminds me of my mom, or that reminds me of my grandma, that's more of a top-down process. That's you thinking and making a connection first and then influencing your perception of that smell. Hey, if you have a really good relationship with your mom and grandma, you smell that flower and essentially your previous experience has led you to perceive it in a favorable way. So that's the contribution of how perceptual processes could be considered top down. It's starting with information that either is your current focus or a previous expectation and that thinking and that understanding of the world is influencing how you perceive the flower. Now, bottom-up and top-down processes, they occur together. It's not one first and then the other goes. It's not sometimes bottom-up and sometimes top-down. They happen in tandem. Therefore, we call this a unified information processing system. This is the process of sensation and perception happening at the same time. Okay, so let's talk about sensation and let's talk about it from a bottom-up perspective. If we're gonna be talking about bottom-up processing, we essentially have to talk about the mailboxes for the different senses. These are gonna be the specialized neurons and specialized cells that take in information from the external world. They're gonna take in the stimulus energy from the outside world. These sensory receptors are going to receive stimulus energies of a particular variety from the outside environment, from the outside world. So sensory receptors are specialized cells that selectively detect and transmit, we call that transduction, right? Sensory information from the outside world to the brain, bottom up. And these sensory receptor cells are going to send those signals from the outside world to the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, via distinct neural pathways. So receptors are going to engage in the bottom-up sensory process of converting external energy into neurological energy. So via transduction, essentially the outside stimulus energy gets converted into an action potential, that is an electrochemical impulse that we learned in chapter three about at which the body knows what to do with that. All or nothing, right? Fire or don't fire. That's how the nervous system communicates. That is the currency or the neurological currency 
of your working brain and nervous system. So this process of converting sensory stimulus energy that was received by the sensory receptors into action potential energy that gets sent to the brain, that's known as transduction. In this slide, you'll see some sensory receptors that we're gonna focus on a little bit more. You have your rods and cones for vision. You have your hair cells that are on the basilar membrane in the auditory system. In regard to touch, you're gonna to have in your skin and dispersed throughout your body, different receptors for pressure, temperature, and pain. And they're specialized to detect that and convert that energy into something that your brain goes, hey, here's pain on your left ankle. Hey, it's getting hotter where you're at. Or hey, the shower water is just too hot right now. In regard to smell, you're gonna have essentially receptor cells for smell. They're in the nasal cavity and they're going to receive chemical energy from the outside world to transmit it directly to the brain. It's gonna go straight into the temporal lobe and limbic system by way of the olfactory nerve. And in regard to taste, you're gonna have little papillae on your tongue. And all of these little packets and places on your tongue, they contain taste buds. And these taste buds, they get replaced. They are the specialized receptors for taste. You also have within your ear, you have a vestibular system that essentially is connecting you with where you're oriented in the world. That has to do with balance and movement and orientation. And taken together, all these really special cells, they allow you to connect with the world. They allow you to respond and interact with the world around you. Without these things, you really wouldn't be able to live the life that you're living right now. Without these sensory receptors, essentially your experience of being a human wouldn't be the same. Now, to make a connection with chapter three, we have to remember that these sensory receptors are specialized for different afferent pathways. This is accessing the brain and spinal cord, right? So just remember, these are sensory nerves and the pathways are sensory or afferent pathways. And they're selective in the type of energy from the outside world that they respond to. So you can think of them as a mailbox at a particular address. Mail of a certain type arrives at their mailbox. Part of what they do is take the stimulus energy from the outside world and transduce it into an action potential. So we know that action potentials are all or none, but we also know that the frequency of firing indicates the intensity of the stimulus. So the smell of flowers as you step outside and there's a neighbor has a rose bush across the street and you can kind of smell faintly just a little bit of rose. That's different than your friend giving you a bouquet of roses and you have just stuck your face in the roses as everybody should, right? You know, you just sort of stick it in there and you just go, oh, wow, like face to face. So the action potentials of a face to face experience with the rose where you're just like taking it in directly, it's right in front of you. Those action potential frequencies are going to be higher than smelling a rose bush that's 30 or 40 feet away. When we talk about those physical properties of the senses, we're talking about physical properties of what the world is sending our way. So in regard to vision, the physical stimulus that we're receiving and detecting has to do with light. We call this photoreception. In regard to hearing, we have audition. We have essentially auditory information because it's the detection of the change in air pressure in the world around you. In regard to touch and also some of the other balance and proprioceptive senses, we're dealing with pressure, vibration, and movement of the body. In regard to smell and taste, we're dealing with chemicals coming our way. They're chemical stimuli, either by way of airborne or something that we've ingested, something that has reached our tongue or our nasal passages. Now that being said, this bottom-up process of sensation is not flawless. It's not always perfect. The transduction process, there's a lot that could be interrupted or cross-wired or somehow misunderstood or misinterpreted from bottom-up to top-down. 
one of the specialized examples of sensory issues and sensory disfluencies is something called synesthesia. Synesthesia is a neurological condition in which stimulation of one sense, for example, hearing, leads to an automatic involuntary experience in a second sensory system, such as vision. You could, in this example, therefore, see a piece of music or see a sound. Simply put, when one sense is activated, another unrelated sense is activated at the same time. So in this example here, you could hear music and simultaneously sense those sounds as having certain swirls or certain colors or movements. You could see the music. It's estimated that around 3 to 5% of the population has some form of synesthesia. And women actually are more likely to become synesthetes than are men. Since synesthesia can involve any combination of the senses, there can be as many as 60 subtypes. However, we're just starting to understand these fascinating connections and disconnections between different sensory systems. While nearly any sensory combination is possible, some of the most well-known ways that it manifests would be auditory tactile, so that's when a sound promotes a specific sensation in the body. Another is chromesthesia, and that happens when certain sounds can trigger someone to see colors. There is grapheme color synesthesia, and that has to do with when letters and numbers are associated with certain colors. Lexical and gustatory synesthesia occurs when hearing certain words triggers different tastes. Another type that even your book talks about is mirror touch synesthesia. And it's been described as a type of supercharged empathy. A person feels as though they're the one that's being touched if they witness someone else being touched. So for example, if I saw somebody else hug somebody else, my body would feel like I'm being hugged. You might ask yourself, well, can you have multiple types? Yeah, many synesthetes or people that have this condition have more than one type of synesthesia. So the most common examples would be grapheme color and also chromesthesia. There does seem to be a genetic component in regard to it in the sense that the likelihood of someone having synesthesia is higher in families that have a synesthete in it. So if a parent has synesthesia or someone in the family has synesthesia, it is more likely for the children to have synesthesia. I think synesthesia is really fascinating, especially because we're just starting to research and understand more and more how the simulation of one sensory pathway can automatically produce a response in another sensory pathway. Another example of the disfluency between sensation and perception has to do with phantom limb pain. So you might have heard this before that sometimes when people have an arm or a leg amputated, even though the actual arm and leg aren't there anymore, they will have the sensation of burning or tingling or pins and needles or crushing or twisting in that limb, even though that limb is not there anymore. So when you amputate a limb, the sensory receptors that are in that limb are no longer physically present, but the area in the brain, the somatosensory and the motor cortex, it had an area there that was devoted to that limb because there's area on your brain that's devoted to different body parts. So it seems to be the case that for phantom limb pain, there is a conflict between this bottom up process and top down process. They're in conflict with one another. Despite the fact that there's not bottom up information because those sensory receptors in the limb are gone, the top down, the brain to body experience remembers having the arm and remembers having the leg. It has an entire area in that part of the brain that's devoted to those, those places, those sensory pathways, those nerves, those afferent nerves. 
The brain still has devoted space to those areas, those afferent and efferent pathways of that limb's nerve system. One of the ways that they treat phantom limb pain involves something called mirror therapy. So they might take a person that has one leg and put them in a position and place a mirror in such a way as it looks like both legs are there. What they're really seeing is like a mirror image of the leg that remains. So they're seeing in the mirror the two legs, even though what they're actually seeing is just like the left leg and then reversed its mirror image. So it's the same leg just mirrored. But the brain being able to see them both there, it helps the brain integrate or make sense of the information. It is derived and moved forward also by these top-down processes where your brain wants to make sense of a sensory world. It wants to make sense and respond in kind. And the mirror gives the brain an understanding or a gestalt, a whole picture. And that helps. That helps the sensation of pain. Many patients will, will say that they experience less pain after these therapy sessions. It's like the brain is rewiring and, and starting to understand the trauma that it's been through. But even with phantom limb pain, there's still a lot that we don't know about how it works, why it happens, and how to help it. So these two things, synesthesia and phantom limb pain, are really great examples of what makes this chapter so fascinating. Psychology still has yet to answer many a question about how we experience the world around us. Okay, in the last slide we talked about how senses can sometimes get cross-communicated, that is synesthesia. We also talked about phantom limb pain, which had to do with bottom-up and top-down processes getting essentially kind of confused with one another. In this next part of the lecture, we want to talk about, more specifically, let's get back to bottom-up, and we're going to talk about sensory thresholds. As we do, I want you to imagine that you are driving in a car on a snowy day. So if you were driving in the snow, and here we have our windshield wipers on, we have the car engine on, it's snowing, so I assume the heater is on, right? There's lots of sounds. If you have a friend in the car with you, or you're trying to listen to a lecture or a podcast, there is other sound in the car as well. Now let's imagine that your engine, your car engine, has something kind of wrong with it. Something is not sounding like it should. In this case of the windshield wipers and the podcast and your friend in the car and the heater on and the car engine going, there's gonna be a lot of noise. And in this case, that means that there's auditory noise. So if you're trying to detect this sound in your engine, you're gonna have a lot of competing stimuli with that particular sound. In this case, I gave you lots of actually auditory stimuli, but remember noise in this case is more than just auditory competing stimuli. So let's imagine that on top of just driving in the car on a snowy day with your friend, that you're also having a slight little headache, so you have the sensation of slight pressure and pain behind your right eye. You know, hmm, a little headache there. And you're driving and you are chewing a piece of gum. So you have the taste of the gum and the taste of chewing on the gum and the sounds of chewing on the gum, right, within your own, your own face. If I'm trying to detect that sound in the engine, that rattling sound, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of irrelevant and competing stimuli, whether that's auditory, gustatory, visual, or even in your pain perceptors of kind of feeling your own body or feeling that headache on the right side. Sensory thresholds are really about our ability to detect information from the external world. And you might ask yourself, why is that important? Well, it's important because if there's something wrong with your engine and you're driving in the snow with your best friend, you really don't want to put yourself in danger of crashing or hurting someone else if that engine is going to stop working, you don't want to slide off the road. You want to pull off safely at the next gas station and figure out what's wrong, right? So we want to detect things and detect them quickly. 
especially stuff that might have bearing on our survival. So let's talk about absolute thresholds. Broadly speaking, an absolute threshold is the minimum amount of a stimulus energy that can be detected. But since our ability to detect things depends on noise, right? And it varies from even time to time, we therefore call it absolute when we can detect that stimulus energy at that level of intensity 50% of the time. You might be sort of confused, like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, absolute really sort of means absolute, right? So let's go on our car drive again, just to sort of make this make sense. In the example that I gave you with a snowy day and the windshield wipers and a headache and you're chewing gum and the heater's on and your friend's talking and there's a podcast playing, <laughs> you might not detect this engine rattle, this sound. You might not detect it until it gets pretty loud, right? Whereas if the heater was off or your friend wasn't in the car or maybe you didn't have a headache or didn't have gum in your mouth, you might detect it sooner at a lower level. And since your detection ability varies to some degree, we essentially call an absolute threshold something that is 50% of the time it can be detected at that level. This slide gives you some examples of some absolute thresholds. So all of those things don't indicate that you always see a candle flame at 30 miles away on a dark, clear night. <laughs> it means that on average, 50% of the time, that is kind of the midpoint and the place at which there is an absolute threshold for detection of that particular thing. So an absolute threshold is about detection. Another way to think about this absolute threshold is by asking how dim or how low in intensity can a stimulus be and still be detected 50% of the time. Now, absolute thresholds are generally measured under incredibly controlled situations and in conditions that are optimal for sensitivity. But sometimes we're actually more interested in how much difference in the stimuli is required for us to detect that something has changed. You drive your car all the time, you know the way that your engine normally sounds. How much change has to take place in how it sounds for you to notice that something is off or something has changed. How much in the sight, sound, and feel of your car have to change for you to be able to detect the difference between normal engine function and maybe something is off a little bit. This difference is something that we call the just noticeable difference or difference threshold. The just noticeable difference is the degree of difference that is needed for you to detect a change. It is the smallest difference in that stimulus energy required to accurately detect a difference to say, yeah, something's different at least 50% of the time. Whereas absolute threshold has to do with detection of just something being there or not, just noticeable difference or difference threshold has to do with discriminating whether something has changed in intensity. Now, this figure, this amount of where you can detect a difference in stimulus energy 50% of the time, that is dependent on the stimulus magnitude such that stimulus intensity impacts the just noticeable difference. This is something that's going to be called essentially Weber's law. And Weber's law is essentially that two stimuli must differ by a constant minimum percentage, not, a, not an absolute amount, but a percentage to be perceived as different. When we say that the just noticeable difference increases with stimulus magnitude, this doesn't mean that your sensitivity increases. It actually means that your sensitivity decreases. So let me give you an example of this idea that the just noticeable difference increases with stimulus magnitude. This means that when you increase stimulus magnitude, the amount of stimulus change necessary for detection, the just noticeable difference, <laughs> 
that amount actually increases. Let's say that you are at home and it's, it's very quiet and you have your cell phone ringer set on low. It's, it's really sort of as low as it can be. In that environment at home, the difference between not hearing your cell phone and hearing your cell phone in that context with low stimulus magnitude of energies around you, you can detect a, a, a stimulus change. You can hear that your phone has beeped. But if you want to hear your cell phone beep when you're at a rock concert, that's going to have to be your cell phone turned up like really, really, really loud. And you might not even detect that difference if the concert was really, really loud around you. So in a different setting, you're going to need a much, much higher amount of stimulus energy to be able to detect a just noticeable difference. This actually means that you have a decrease in sensitivity as your stimulus magnitude gets larger and larger and larger. So this reminds us that the just noticeable difference is not an absolute number. It is a number that's dependent on stimulus energy around you and context in which you are placed. Now, Weber's law is also called Fechner's law. Essentially, Fechner was Weber's graduate student, and they both worked on essentially the psychophysics involved here. The combined work of Weber and Fechner is especially useful to us in regard to hearing and vision research. This is important to us because it is an explanation of how just noticeable differences work. So Weber and Fechner's law is essentially a mathematical model of the difference threshold, stating that the magnitude needed to detect a physical change in the stimulus around you is proportional to the absolute magnitude of that stimulus. This is a constant minimum percentage and not a constant amount. The difference threshold is about how much percentage of change has to change in the stimulus magnitude for me to be able to discriminate between no sound in my engine and a sound in my engine. The difference threshold is the percentage of change that has to happen in the stimulus that you need in order to detect a difference. You know that the absolute threshold refers to the smallest detectable level of stimulation 50% of the time. The difference threshold involves your ability to detect differences in the stimulation levels 50% of the time. It tells us that the just noticeable difference is a constant proportion, not amount, but proportion of the original stimulus. Whether that stimuli is brightness, sweetness, weight, pressure, noise, or really any of the other senses. We call Weber and Fechner's law a psychophysical law. They are interested in the psychophysics of your perceptual abilities. Okay, so I wanna to move to the next slide on signal detection theory. And signal detection theory is really important because we've been talking about thresholds, we've been talking about detection and discrimination, and being able to basically tell differences between a world that's changing around us, right? Is my engine fine or is my car engine, is there something wrong? Me being able to detect A, that something is going on to actually hear it and sense it, and also discriminate and tell the difference, those are important features of a sensory and perceptual world, right? Within that world, we make a lot of decisions about how to engage with the stimulus energies of the world around us. We make a lot of decisions, essentially, about the things that we're sensing and perceiving. Signal detection theory suggests that sensory thresholds are not just fixed characteristics of a person, but in fact, they shift around depending on context, motive, moods, attention, and other psychological factors. 
in signal detection theory, you'll see that people are essentially trying to determine, is something going on here? And also, what do I need to decide about the information that I'm experiencing? In this picture, you see a pilot or an engineer. He's in flight command, so he has different radars and different screens, and he's looking around. So is that blip on the radar, is that another plane? Is that a weather event? Is that an incoming missile? <laughs> like, what, what have I detected? Or is that a mistake? Is that just the system, the system made a little bit of a mistake? Gosh, did I just see a little blip on the radar there? Was it there or was it not there? If it was there, how do I respond? What is my criteria for responding? Do every time I see something on the screen, I call my commander? Or do I only call my commander if certain things are also there in which I make the decision only if those other prerequisites are met? That's my criterion or my basis for making that decision. So let's use this example of you being the flight command center. Let's say you're a military organization, so you have different flight radars in front of you, have different feeds of information. It's your job to watch certain parts of the airways and respond with any threats or any disfluencies or anything that might be of concern. That's your job. In signal detection theory, let's walk through what some of the options for you might be in regard to seeing something on one of the screens. There are four possible outcomes because there are two responses of yours and there are two realities of the environment. So let's talk about your two responses. You can either say, yes, that is something that I saw, or you can say, no, I didn't see something, it's not important. Those are your two options. I see it or I don't see it. And in this example, we're using sight, but it doesn't have to be the sense of sight. It could be other things as well. In regard to the realities of the signal being sent, there are two options. In this example that we're using, there's either a threat in the airways there, present, there's actually something, there's a plane, there's something that's, that's in the radar that's justifiably actually being picked up. That would be signal present. There is that little blip on the radar actually represents something truthfully in the external world, signal present. Signal absent would mean that, nope, there actually in the real world was nothing that corresponded to that little blip. There actually was nothing in the real world that actually corresponded with the truthful, justifiable, observable, real threat. There was nothing there. Signal present or signal absent. So let's imagine that there is something in the air that is being picked up by the radar and you see the blip on the radar and you go, yes, there's something there. Let me call my commander. That would be considered a hit. You are making a correct decision based on that information. The signal is present. There is something there and you do see it. We would say that you've made a correct choice. That is a hit. If you saw a blip on the radar or thought you saw one, and in the real world, there is really nothing there. There is nothing in the airways. There's nothing that, that would be picked up in reality. The signal is absent. It is not there. If you say, yes, I saw something, and you call your commander, that's what we would call a false alarm. It is a mistake you've made. You thought you saw something when there was nothing there. Now, if you're in the flight command booth and uh, you took a text message or you looked down or you grabbed your coffee cup and you just, you didn't see, you didn't see something. Something kind of blinked in, in one of the screens, but you just didn't perceive it. But in the real world, there was something indeed happening, something that needed to be picked up, something that accurately was threatening. If you missed it, 
If you said, nope, everything's fine, your commander calls and says, hey, any changes in the radar, anything going on in that region over there? And you say, no, sir, I didn't see anything. That would be a mistake, right? The signal was present, but you missed it. We would call that a miss. But alternatively, if you were sitting in the booth and just watching and everything was going on and you correctly saw that nothing was going on and your commander called you and said, hey, has anything changed? And you say correctly, you say, no, sir, I don't see anything, nothing of concern. That is a correct decision and we call that a correct rejection. Now, as you can see, there's a trade-off between making errors of one kind or the other. If we're careful not to raise a false alarm, we run a greater risk of missing something that is actually there. If, on the other hand, we're careful to not miss anything, we run a greater risk of raising false alarms. So in some ways, we have to decide which error is worse. So I hope that you can see that the sensation to perception route, this bottom up route, it's not always just a perfect decision because you're making top down decisions at the same time. Perceiving stimuli is not just bottom up, it's also top down. As signal detection theory shows you, people make decisions about the sensitivity level of what information means when they receive it. So this sensation to perception and perception understanding sensation, bottom up and top down, they occur at the same time and top down processes absolutely play a role in our understanding of the world around us. That our perceptions also have importance in regard to the decisions that we make and the actions that we'll take or not take. So since perceiving stimuli is not just a bottom-up process, what are some factors that affect our perception? Well, your book talks about attention, selective attention, and perceptual set. We know that whether or not you're paying attention to the radar screens could have a bearing on whether or not you perceive a threat or not. Attention is a huge part that impacts the perceptual process. And attention has to do with focusing awareness on a narrowed aspect of the environment. Now, I know because I listen to podcasts and lectures and videos and books on tape and Audible all the time. There's sometimes when I'll be listening to something and I'll know and feel that my attention drifted. So I have to go back like 30 seconds and be like, okay, Bryn, buckle down, listen a little bit more. You know, if you're listening to this in a really quiet environment with very few distractions, you're going to pay more attention. You'll be able to perceive it so much better than if you have interruptions and stuff going on. So in regard to attention, things that are novel or new or bigger in size or brighter in color or move around or have emotional value to them, those things are more likely to be attended to. But we know that our attention isn't perfect every time, right? We know that even in great situations uh, where we're paying attention as much as possible, sometimes we just miss information. Sometimes we're so emotional about an issue, we just don't pay attention to other things that are going, going on. Or sometimes we're so focused on a particular task that we're blind to a bigger thing that's going on around us. Simons and Chabris did this experiment in 1999, and they basically showed that inattentional blindness is essentially us missing to detect an unexpected event when we're focused and very, very occupied with a particular task, very engaged in a particular task. When the task is difficult and occupying a lot of our effort and when that distraction is something that is different than the task at hand and it's different than we expected, we sometimes just go inattentionally blind to it. We don't even notice it. And sometimes doctors have even found that if they're giving bad news to patients, if a patient is obviously very stressed out about the experience of receiving a diagnosis or receiving information, 
there might be so much emotion going on that some of the words that the doctor says about treatment and about options that the person might physically hear them. They might sense them and receive them, but not really perceive them because the emotion is taking the energy away from the attentive perceptual processes. Another thing to note here is something called perceptual set. And perceptual set has to do with top-down influences in perception. This is where essentially our expectations, our previous experiences, our cultural learning, our learning, our history, influence our perceptions of the world. A perceptual readiness or a predisposition to perceive something in a particular way. We'll talk about this in a later chapter, but this expectancy effect or the power of expectancies or self-fulfilling prophecies are tremendously well-researched and well-regarded and demonstrated in psychology, especially social psychology. So let's review. Your attention processes involve narrowing down your focus to a particular thing. When you narrow down your focus, you're essentially selecting your attention down to a particular facet or a particular job. That's hard to do, though, when you have a lot of inputs. So if you're listening to this lecture and there's four billion things going on around you, selective attention is when you just narrow down just on this slide, just on my voice, just on understanding this concept right now. But we also know that our emotions can sometimes get in the way of us being able to select our focus and be able to narrow down our focus. So if something's going on with your friends or family or just like everything with the world around us, right? If that's taking your attention or provoking emotion, then focusing in on this lecture and its content might be a little bit hard. You might go somewhat blind to being able to perceive or remember some of these details. And inattentional blindness shows us that if you're very focused on these lecture slides and really zoning in, really kind of putting your full focus there, if something sort of strange or atypical happens, you might not notice the really strange music that your neighbor has decided to start playing because you are inattentionally blind by way of focusing in on this task. And in regard to perceptual set, if you have a positive expectation about school and psychology and, and what you're doing in university, then you might experience this lecture differently than someone that doesn't come in with those positive expectations. If you come in expecting to learn and expecting to be engaged and expecting to understand, you might be able to learn and understand and comprehend better because of the perceptual set, the top-down process. All right, so let's do an example of these concepts. All right, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of rectangles. And all of the rectangles have essentially primary colors. It'll be your job as fast as you can to name and speak out each color of the rectangles that you see on the slide. Are you ready? Ready, set, go. Okay, how'd you do? Pretty fast, right? So in the next slide, you're gonna see words and the words themselves have different color ink. Your job is the same task as before, you need to name the color shown and you just ignore what word it is. You just need to name the color. Okay. Just like you saw here with the rectangles, you, that bottom row is blue, yellow, blue, right? You want to name it, name it as fast as possible. You're going to name the color of each word as fast as you can, ignoring what the word says, ready, set, go. All right, so tell me, which slide were you quicker at naming the colors for? The first slide or the second slide? 
Well, if you're like most people, the first slide is much faster than the second slide. And this is something called the Stroop effect. The Stroop effect essentially shows us a failure of selective attention. And also at the same time, it shows us the automaticity of top-down processing. The difficulty in reporting the color of ink is not due to us having trouble identifying the color. Otherwise, the first slide would have been hard too, right? But rather, the extra effort it takes in the second slide in inhibiting the act of reading. In the second slide, we have two tasks. We have the automaticity of top-down, because words are important to us. Very important. They're automatically important. And evidently, we cannot stop ourselves from reading once we have learned to do it. It's become sort of automatic and quick. So the Stroop effect shows us how top-down processing is involved with our attentive processes. I think it also shows to some degree this perceptual set stuff, which is if you've learned to read, you now have previous experience with words. And that experience with words gives you a background with them and a perceptual slant towards them. So what's a good way of sort of summing up some of these things? Well, it's important to note that who you are is not just a bottom-up machine. You're not just a robot taking in sensory information, crunching the numbers perfectly like a calculator, and then responding perfectly like a machine would, like a robot would. You are a top-down machine as well, bottom-up plus top-down at the same time, trying to make good decisions for your safety and your tasks and the world around you, given what is happening around you, but also what you know about yourself and others in the world around you. All right, you guys, I have one more slide for us to get through in regard to this first part of Chapter 4, because Chapter 4 is so awesome and so interesting. So let's talk a little bit about another factor that influences perception, and that is something called sensory adaptation. So another factor that influences your perception of the world around you has to do with a change in responsiveness of your sensory system. So in general, your sensory system is especially attuned and attentive to differences in the environment around you. If things stay relatively the same, that's not as important as noticing differences. And you can imagine that, right? That very, very loud, abrupt sound, your system needs to be quick at responding to a big change like that. But the ticking of a clock that just keeps ticking, your brain can probably relax, especially if the sound is something that's not a threat, it's consistent, it's unchanging, it's not threatening, it's not varying in any way. So what sensory adaptation is, is an actual change in responsiveness of your sensory system. And that's based on the level of surrounding stimulation that you're in or the context that you're in. Sensory adaptation is essentially physiological adaptation. Your sensory receptors actually fire less frequently to unchanging stimuli. So this constant or unchanging information that's being received, the receptors themselves become less responsive and therefore they don't send as frequently those action potential signals to the central nervous system. Now sensory adaptation sometimes gets confused with another term called habituation and I want to articulate the difference between the two of those. Habituation deals with that same thing of dealing with unchanging or constant repetitive information. In a classic sense, habituation has to do with the sensory receptors from the ears. They're actually taking in the change in the sound, but not sending it to the cortex or the brain. So the actual hair cells in the basilar membrane of your cochlea in your ear, they are receiving the ticking clock they are actually receiving signal, but because it's unchanging information and especially unchanging information that is unimportant to survival or, or any need to respond immediately, the sensory receptors don't send that signal via the auditory nerve to the brain. So the brain just doesn't really see it. You sense it, but you don't perceive it. 
Sensory adaptation is different though. Sensory adaptation means that the sense receptors actually adapt and become less responsive to unchanging information. Therefore, when they become less responsive, they're not sending as much of a frequent signal to the higher areas in the brain. So sensory adaptation has to do with the reduction in the frequency of action potential signals over time. While habituation is the nervous system selectively filtering out a stimulus. In sensory adaptation, the sensory neuron begins firing action potentials when presented with a stimulus, but over time, the neuron fires fewer, less frequent action potentials in response to that continuous stimulus. This results in a reduced perception of that particular unchanging stimulus. With habituation, there's no change in the number of action potentials being fired from the sensory neuron. That's a physiological level. But the mind begins to filter out the stimulus via selective attention. So in some ways, sensory adaptation involves physiological adaptation and habituation involves psychological adaptation. So sensory adaptation is a reduction in our sensitivity to a stimulus that's unchanging. So for example, if you go into a dark room or you go outside at night, your eyes eventually adjust to the darkness around you because your pupils enlarge to let in more light. Likewise, if you're in a movie theater that's really dark for a couple of hours and then you leave the movie theater, you know that you're now in bright light and your eyes will need to adjust by narrowing your pupils. It's a form of sensory adaptation. So what can we take away from this? We can take away that your system is really elegantly made in such a way as it wants to be able to make quick and efficient and relevant decisions. It wants to be sensitive to things that matter and it wants to not focus on stuff that's not important. And it also wants to disregard unimportant information so it can focus on the bigger stuff. So sensory adaptation is your body's way of trying to take in and understand the world around you in such a way as it's as efficient and quickly discerning as possible. And that can be done at both psychological levels from top down and also at the sensory level or bottom up level where the sensory receptors respond differently. They adapt their level of responsiveness. Isn't that cool? So from top down to bottom up, you are a system that wants to make sense of the world. All right, so we've gone through some basic principles of sensation and perception. We've covered bottom up and top down processing. We've talked a little bit about sensory receptors and the physical properties of the world around us. We've also talked about the complicated interrelationship between bottom up and top down processing in making decisions for things such as our discussion of signal detection theory. And we've ended lecture by talking about attention, expectation, and top-down processes in the perceptual process. So good job, you guys. That's a lot to cover in one lecture. In the second part of this lecture, we're gonna talk about vision and hearing and depth perception, as well as some of the other senses that we wanna focus on. All right, you guys, you did it. I'll catch you on the next lecture. Good job.